Hello, Magga. Hi, how are you, Justin? Great, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on our Go Beyond Summit. We My pleasure. Are honored and privileged to have you speak with us and hear your wisdom on electricity, pollution, and uh, all this invisible toxins in, in, in man-made EMF. And so let's give the audience more of a background. I know in, in our world, you're really well known in the electricity space and your knowledge and wisdom on it. So please share, us, share with us your background and what brought you into this whole electromagnetic space and understanding it and, and wanting to solve this challenge. Okay, well, um, I got my um, degrees, my bachelor's and my PhD at the University of Toronto. And um, I trained as an environmental toxicologist. So I've always been interested in, you know, protecting the environment. I love nature. I was brought up in nature as a young child. And when, um, you know, when you're in a big city, you sort of miss it. And when I saw that there was just so much pollution going on and so much damage to the environment, I really wanted to do my job and, you know, protecting, you know, Mother Earth kind of thing. So very idealistic um, when I was a young student. And I'm still very idealistic now. So uh, my background um, dealt with um, chemical toxicants in the environment, mostly air pollution, water quality issues, how they affected lakes and rivers and streams how they affected terrestrial ecosystems, and how they affected human health as well. So there were a lot of different aspects to it, uh, very holistic in nature. I just realized there's the sun that's coming in, so I'm just going to move back a little bit so my nose is not the only thing in the sun. <laughs> You're glowing, don't worry. <laughs> um, anyway, so that was my background. Uh, we did research on acid rain before acid rain was recognized as a serious problem. And uh, when the Clean Air Act came in between Canada and the United States, I lost my interest in doing acid rain research. And I realized that I enjoy working in an area that's controversial, in an area that needs policy um, in order to make improvements. And I stumbled across electromagnetic fields. Um, one of the courses I teach at Trent University, where I'm a professor, is a course called Pollution Ecology. And in this course, we deal with everything from mercury to asbestos to PCBs, you name it. We, we talk about it to the point where by Christmas, you know, the students are ready to commit suicide because they realize, you know, there's just so much going wrong right now with the way that we're dealing with, with the earth. Um, yeah, and human health. And um, so I became interested in electromagnetic fields. I just started reading about it, thinking that I was going to perhaps lecture on it because um, when I became interested, it was about 1995, and there was a lot of uh, information about uh, children developing leukemia who lived near power lines. And so that was where, you know, that was my first introduction to electromagnetic pollution. And I remember when I went to the literature, it was very um, confusing. Some of the science was showing there's, it's harmful, some of the science was showing um, there was absolutely no effect. And so I realized that you know, the scientists weren't yet at a stage where they could definitively say that there's a causal relationship between children developing cancers and living near a power line. So I left it for a few years. And then um, my husband um, went to um, England to visit his brother, who was uh, an electrical <coughs> engineer. <clears throat> and one night they were walking the dog and my brother-in-law took out a fluorescent tube and held it up under a power line, one of those high voltage transmission lines, and the tube lit up. It just glowed in his hand. And my husband came back and told me about it and I was really excited. You know, we lived in the country on a farm and I just went out near the nearest uh, transmission line, you know, took a, to, held up my fluorescent tube and it lit up. Um, so that really piqued my interest again. And I remember going to a, a friend, um, a faculty member in physics, and saying, you know, this is what happened. I'm so excited. What does it mean? You know, is, does this mean that uh, there's a harmful effect of electromagnetic fields? And he said, well, no, not at all. He said, and he explained why the tube lit up. And when I asked him if there was a potential link with cancer, he said, absolutely not. And I remember asking for, you know, why, what was the rationale for his opinion? What was he basing his opinion on? 
And he said, this frequency doesn't have enough energy to um, contribute to cancer. So he said, it's not ionizing, and so it just can't, can't contribute to cancer. So um, that wasn't a good enough answer for me. Um, and so I basically went to the literature and read everything I could get my hands on to try to figure out whether or not I thought it was harmful. And it took me three years to go through the literature. I started with looking at power lines and childhood cancers. I then shifted to dirty electricity um, and work that you know I've done with Dave Stetzer on power quality issues. Um, we did work on ground current, which is a real problem on farms. Um, I looked at radio frequency radiation, which is one of the critical things today. And um, I really came up uh, with the concept that not only is this harmful, but people don't realize how harmful it is, and it's just going to get a lot worse. And so that was my introduction to doing actual research. Up to that point, I was just studying what was already published, and then I began to do my own research in the area. Wow, fantastic. What so is that, was my, that was my introduction to, to the whole field. Um, and we've done studies on light bulbs. We've worked with people who are electrically hypersensitive. We've done studies looking at heart rate and how it affects the heart. Um, we've worked with diabetics, and we find that diabetics who are electrically sensitive, it affects their blood uh, sugar levels in their body. We've worked with people who have multiple sclerosis, who have very severe tremors within their hands and have difficulty walking, and found that when we cleaned up the dirty power in their homes, that they actually walked a lot better, uh, a lot of their symptoms disappeared. So there are some solutions to it, but the problem is getting so bad now that um, it's really, really hard to deal with it um, for anyone in their home to deal with it. Now, why is, why is it so bad? I mean, why, does, why is electricity, dirty electricity, radio frequency just all so bad for us? <clears throat> well, it seems to um, increase um, stress proteins in the body. So it's having an effect at the cellular level. Um, there's research that shows that it interferes with the uh, blood-brain uh, barrier, making it much more permeable, which means that chemicals that are normally kept out of the brain are, and, and the spinal cord are actually able to penetrate. They're able to get in there and do their damage. Uh, also, there are more and more appliances now and devices in the home that uh, rely on uh, radio frequency or microwave radiation. I went to a lighting conference in Germany, and we've done research on lights and, and some of the energy efficient compact fluorescent light bulbs, those squiggly light bulbs, are really, really bad for people. Um, and a number of them were getting headaches and migraines and heart palpitations. So we did a study looking at light bulbs to try to figure out what are they emitting, what effect is this having on the population. And I remember I was invited to this conference in Germany to talk about our, our research on light bulbs. And I said, you know, can you send me a light bulb that you think is a really good light bulb? Because I've been looking for one for a long time. Yeah. And they said, oh, yes, we can definitely do that. So they sent me a light bulb, and I tested it. And it emitted radio frequencies because you can now turn it on and off with your cell phone. Oh. So this is where the technology is going. And when I went to the conference, I talked to the manufacturer, and I said, you don't want a light bulb like this. You don't want to increase the microwaves in a home. They were as bad as Wi-Fi, as bad as a cordless phone. And those are probably the two worst things that you can have in your home to expose yourself to microwave radiation. And yet they were doing this. And his, his remark to me was, but that's where the industry is going. So we want to remain competitive. And I thought, well, you're going to remain competitive to the point where um, people are not going to buy your products. And eventually, they're going to sue you for making them ill, uh, because that's where the technology is actually taking us. So the question you asked is, why is it getting worse? And the reason it's getting worse is everyone wants to design some device that is wireless to make it more sexy, more progressive, more convenient, whatever the reasons are. Yeah. And because of that, we're just exposing ourselves to a soup of microwave radiation, and our bodies can't handle it. Unbelievable. Yeah, it is. It's getting <laughs> out of control. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is an article in the Wall Street Journal about 
the connectivity and, and how it's really the car industry is really pushing the cell companies to come out with 5G faster and there's no environmental or biochemical studies, no bio studies on, on any of the research. So it seems uh, we're preempting a lot of this. Now, how do we go back to what we know is, is considered a safe level, uh, uh, whereas for a gauss, like one milligauss or micro you know, watts, per meter squared for you know, dirty electricity or, or radio frequency levels. We know these meters meter off the chart when they're on. We know the safe levels. How, how do we bridge that gap as, a, just as industry experts teaching the other one to where we want to start making products that are more in the safe level and, and as consumers we want to only buy products that are in the safe level? Well, when it comes to using microwaves, I think um, it's fair to say that if you're using for, for something that's mobile, like your cell phone, that you can't have that wired, right? Because, you, you know, you can't have a, a, a cord long enough that it'll take you everywhere you're going to go with your cell phone. But when it comes with things that are stationary, so for example, a computer communicating with a printer it doesn't have to be wireless. You can simply have a cord that connects the two. You don't need a wireless keyboard. You don't need a wireless mouse. So a lot of the things that are currently wireless don't need to be wireless. There's absolutely no reason for that to happen. So if we simply converted everything that didn't need to be wireless because it's relatively stationary, then um, we, would, we would reduce our exposure enormously. When it comes to the devices that do need to be wireless, uh, so for example, your cell phone, provided that you keep it off as often as possible, so you turn the, the Bluetooth off, you turn the Wi-Fi, you turn your GPS, you turn you know, your cell provider off, then you're not exposed to that radiation. However, if you have them on, even when you're not using them, every few minutes your cell phone is going to go ping where's the nearest cell phone tower you know ping where's the nearest cell phone tower and that's just exposing your body to microwave radiation so part of it is designing wired technology rather than wireless technology part of it is using wireless technology in a smarter way and the word smart unfortunately has been taken over with smart meters and smart appliances and the, the reason they use the word smart is because there's two-way communication between your, your meter, you know, this measuring how much electricity you're using, and the utility. But that doesn't have to be wireless either. That's not going to move. So you can have simply wire that, which would reduce your exposure enormously. They're coming out with smart appliances, which means that your fridge, your stove, your uh, you know, washing machine are going to connect with your smart meter and they're going to say, okay, I'm working, I'm on, you know, that kind of thing. And then that information is going to be transmitted to the utility. Why they need to know that, I don't know. Um, they make the claim that the smart meters are on for a few seconds a day, but we've measured ones that are on constantly because they're, they're chattering to each other um, and getting that information out. And people who now live in homes where there's one smart meter for the electricity, another smart meter for the water, another smart meter for the gas, suddenly their levels of exposure in their home have gone up. And this is something that they can't avoid unless the, the utility says, we'll wire it for you uh, and, or we'll put it on a, a, a phone line or something. Uh, and you won't have to pay any additional fees. They're not doing that. If anything, they don't give you the option, and when they do give you the option, they charge you for it. So every month you have to pay a certain amount for someone to come out and do a reading for you. Um, so part of it is the way we use the technology. Part of the way um, is how the manufacturers are making the technology. One of the things that people probably don't realize is that um, they're Wi-Fi. They can actually... Uh, go ahead and use wired connections in the home and simply plug their computer into any electrical wire and use it um, you know, in, in that kind of way without having to go Wi-Fi, uh, wireless. If they decide to use Wi-Fi, one of the things I recommend is that they turn it off at night, at the very least, while they're sleeping. This is a time when your body is regenerating, 
It's, you know, fixing all the problems that, you know, you've developed during the day. And if you don't get a good night's sleep and you don't go through that regeneration process, eventually something's going to give and you're going to have symptoms of ill health. And, you know, if that affects an organ, a heart, for example, or if it converts into a cancer, then, you know, you're up S-H-I-T Creek. <laughs> um, you know, uh, because then you've got something very, very serious to work with. So the best thing people can do is minimize their exposure, at least in the environments that they can control, um, and, um, and change their behavior when it comes to environments that they can't control so that they're, they're not exposed to that radiation. Oh, definitely. I mean, those are great points. Uh, the computer, the cell phone, you're just switching these modes off. I mean, they're literally wired to turn on every single mode, so it's always on 24-7, so they don't sleep. Uh, it, it's, so when we could just limit it to only a couple billions of waves per second versus you know, 10 different devices on all the time at, at almost trillions of waves per second, it'll be a, a lot yeah, less stress on our body. Now, yeah. Can we, can we talk about the 5G coming and, and how you know, everyone's pushing everyone for it without any bio studies or environmental studies? Uh, share with us your insight on that, please. Sure, definitely. Well, the 5G stands for fifth generation, as you know. And um, one of the problems with 5G is that it's never been really tested. It's using a higher um, frequency. I'm, I'm just looking for something on my computer that I want to show you. That's why my eyes are sort of popping around. Um, it's going to use frequencies that are in you know, 20, 30 uh, gigahertz, which are billions of cycles per second. What we do know about this uh, technology is that it's being used by the military, the US military for crowd control. They have a weapon um, that basically consists of an antenna one of these, you know, round antennas that they put on a truck and they could take it out in the middle of the crowd. And I think the frequency they're using is 80 gigahertz. So it's 80 billion cycles per second. And if they turn this on for just a split second, whoever that antenna is aimed at will have excruciating pain for the length of time that the antenna is turned on. And what it's doing is it's penetrating just the surface of the skin and affecting your um, nerve endings, causing um, excruciating pain because of the heat. So it's actually vaporizing your, your sweat glands, um, and it's like you're being scolded. Um, now, they've tested it on soldiers who have, you know, winter gear on, you know, lead, lead all sorts of things on them, and it goes right through, penetrates um, their body, and they can't get their clothes off fast enough. They're in so much pain. So the fact that they're using this is, you know, in, in terms of crowd control to really, you know, adversely affect people. And yet we're going to be exposed to obviously much lower levels, but everywhere doesn't make any sense to me. If it starts penetrating the surface of your skin and starts affecting your nerves, uh, I mean, our skin is our largest organ and those nerves, if they become sensitized, you'll have so many problems. You know, just talk to a dermatologist. Um, even if you have something like eczema, it's a real problem for people. And if it's associated with pain or itchiness or something, it'll drive people crazy. So, you know, one of the things that we're anticipating from the 5G is that it's going to have a surface neurological skin effect uh, on people. Uh, and we won't be able to avoid it. So uh, they're rolling it out. It's going to cost billions of dollars to roll it out. We're going to ultimately pay for that um, through the services it provides. And the primary reason they want to roll it out is so that you can download a video in three seconds rather than five minutes. And, you know, from a health perspective, that just doesn't make any sense to me at all. And although we're focusing primarily on people, this technology affects nature as well. There are studies showing it affects bird populations, it affects trees. So not only are we destroying, you know, the potential health of a lot of people, but we're also beginning to destroy nature as well with our technology. Right, and, and the bees communicate through radio frequency. So that, and, and if the bees go and the birds go, then we go because we won't have any food. That's right. It almost, you know, reminds me, and I'm not a doomsday person at all. I'm actually very positive. I think, 
once we realize how wrong the road we've taken, how wrong it is, uh, I think industry can reverse itself very quickly and I think we'll make changes. But um, it reminds me of the fall of Rome where, you know, the wealthy, and it's going to be well-educated people who can afford the technology who are going to get sick first. It's not going to be people who can't afford this, this stuff. So it'll be the more educated and the richer among us who are suffering, particularly with their smart homes where, you know, they, you know, they talk to a computer that will turn lights on for them and, and do everything else. Um, but it reminds me of the fall of Rome, the Roman Empire, where there was so much lead from the pipes that were bringing water, you know, drinking water, but the goblets that the wealthy were drinking out of drinking their wine was dissolving that lead and causing the fall of Rome because the emperors were so crazy by the end of it that uh, they simply couldn't rule appropriately. And I think the same is beginning to happen here. Wow, that's unbelievable. <laughs> it really is. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm scratching my head just going, oh man. And now, I mean, a lot of the technology, I think they, the future possibly is just satelliting, beaming it down nonstop 24 seven. So when we have that going, it, you know, the earthing or the grounding, the shielding, it's just, it's going to become really challenging. So I think understanding the balance act of loving technology, but knowing when enough is enough and how st the strength of these signals can really compromise people, especially guys like me that work with people on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I'm super sensitive to it. And it, it's, 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 uh, it's something that I know so many people have sensitivities to and then can feel that vibration and can feel energy really well. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things, a, a friend of mine uh, made a PDF that I can, I can share with you and you can share with your audience. And basically what he did is he recorded the frequencies that the different devices make. And I, if you, I think you might be able to hear this. So I can play something and tell you what it is. So it's the frequency converted into sound. And let's just see if this will work. Hold on. One moment, here we go. That's Bluetooth. This is the baby deck phone. This is the mother's deck. This is um, a cordless phone. Sorry. This is a Wi-Fi. And this is a cell phone. And most of the time we would have all of these things on in our home. And this is basically what it would sound like. So if we could hear this stuff, it would be absolutely horrific. Isn't that terrible? Oh, that's so they've actually recorded the sounds. And I take this and I, I let people know. And I say, you know, if you could hear this, you would not have it on. Unfortunately, you can't. And until it does damage to your body, you don't even realize that this is causing a problem. Oh, Magda, that's incredible. I love that, it, hear, just hearing that. And, and I equate it too, there's videos on YouTube of suspended bridges and guys pinging it. And these bridges are bending and swaying, but our homes, they're rooted in the ground, they're cemented, they're bolted in the ground, so they don't move and sway. But that's what the, the vibration of these pipes are doing and these non-ferrous pipes, and they're, they carry all these vibrations. and and our bodies, our cells are just getting vibrated and that, that's the opening up, causing cell damage. And so that vibration, those sounds are just so toxic for us. That's right, yeah, I agree. It's like, ha it's like having, if you use light as an analogy, it's like having strobe lights on all the time, it would absolutely drive you crazy. Yeah, and so we have, I mean, you mentioned Dave Stetzer and we have his meters that meter it. What, what I found, is when there's a solar panel, the dirty electricity is off the charts. If there's dry cleaners or those huge, huge AC units, it's off the charts. Pull equipment off the charts. Uh, and so his meters are unbelievable. And I, I mean, I think it should be a standard for buying any home or leasing any office. There's going to be a new wave of commerce and it's going to be an awareness of what is really behind these walls, not relying on, hey, this is a cool corner or what have you. And then you have the Gauss meters, that meter the electricity. So when you see a power line 
and the big trash can like generator on it, you can understand that if that's on the other side of the wall, you're going to be cooking yourself. And then, of course, as you mentioned, all the, the routers, the wireless connections, the nests in the homes, and oh, goodness, the smart meters, making sure that your neighbors aren't right next to your kids' bed or in line with yours or on the outside of your wall as well. That's right. Now, in Europe, they're actually way ahead of us. They have uh, cordless phones and baby monitors that are sound activated. So the baby monitor isn't on all the time, but the baby cries, it alerts the parents. We can't import those to North America. And it turns out the Federal Communication Commission has put a ban on them. And when we tried to trace why on earth would they put a ban on something like this, the information they provided was that um, it interfered with military communication, which doesn't make any sense at all. So in Europe, you can get better technology that we can't purchase here in North America, which is also crazy. Yeah, that's, that's challenging. And, and they have a more awareness, I think. In France, they banned Wi-Fi in elementary schools about three years ago. And that's a big thing. I mean, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and to have her go to school with Wi-Fi that's not been harmonized or cleared or plugged in, I mean, we, can, we have fiber optic cables that can do faster connections than 5G will, and it won't have three frequencies within the 5G all on at the same time, emitting possibly trillions of uh, millimeter waves per second, just like a microwave, but not contained. <laughs> That's right, that's right. Yeah, we're, what we're doing is not very smart. And unfortunately, a lot of people are developing electrical hypersensitivity. The three key things that I've, I've found from that happens with this radiation is it causes cancer. And I use the word cause because that's what it does. Um, there's not just an association, it actually causes cancer. Uh, there was recently the National Toxicology Program study with mice and rats. Uh, that showed an increased risk of certain types of cancers that humans are also getting um, at the levels that they tested, which are below the guidelines, by the way, in North America. It affects reproduction, particularly um, a lot of studies have been done on sperm. Uh, the viability, motility, um, all of that is it's affecting sperm. It's causing deformed sperm. Uh, and it's affecting um, symptoms uh, called electrohypersensitivity that I call rapid aging syndrome because what it's doing is that, that's exactly what the consequences are. It's causing your cells to be stressed so they're aging much more rapidly and when your cells age, your organs age, and when your organs age, your body ages. And so people are getting older on the inside because of this technology. And uh, to help them recover once they've become quite ill from it is really a, a great challenge, especially in today's world where there's so few places that you can go where this technology isn't available. It's so true. I mean, when you're recovering from, if you're sick in, in, in any way, shape, or form, the odds of getting better quicker are just not there right now for us because these stressors are so prevalent. Everywhere we look, they're there and, and your body can't heal when it's under stress. And we have concussion protocols to get rid of the blue light and the EMF because the blood brain barrier uh, is, is compromised and it's trying to heal and it won't allow it. So oh, it's just, yeah, it, it, I, I'm, I totally understand. And we're so grateful for you sharing all this information. Now, where, where can uh, we, learn more about it? What's some resources that you like to look at? Anything you want to share for them to contact you if they need to? What? Well, I, I have a website that I try to keep fairly up to date about things that are going on. Um, and it's just uh, www.magdahabis.com. So it's just my name.com. And I also do a lot of educational uh, YouTube videos. I think it's really important to educate the public. Uh, and decision makers so that eventually they'll make the right decisions. And if you just Google my name and put in video, you'll, a lot of those videos will come up. Um, and they're intended for anyone who's not a real expert in the field who needs a little bit of background information, uh, but that includes experts in other fields. So it's, it's very appropriate for medical doctors and for people in the healthcare profession so they can help their patients recover a lot faster. Excellent. Thank you so much magnahavis.com 
You are fantastic. You guys, she's a professor at Trent University in Ontario, Canada, and brilliant, brilliant wisdom beyond her years. I mean, she is decades ahead of her time in research and knowledge on the talk, topic of electricity, pollution, and EMF radiation. And this is, it's so real for you. You've seen it. You've seen people get sick. I mean, this is, this is something that you've studied for years. It, it's not uh, going to go away when we keep on getting stronger or, or keep on getting stronger signals in, in our life. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.